I've just been finding out some really amazing things that have been happening up there. And we all know that the Arctic, the Arctic Edge is one of the areas that we've seen the greatest change through climate change. So this is really a great subject. Anyhow, uh, Leanne, also if you want to give a little bit more, I don't know your full sure. background. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> All right, thanks very much, Mark, and uh, thanks for taking a bit of time out of your busy holiday schedule, this holiday's approach, and uh, thanks for bringing the pizza to bring in a few more folks. <laughs> 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 Nothing like pizza and beer to, you know, save your crowd. So I just wanted to uh, visit again to Earthwatch uh, and, and to be able to talk with a few of the staff and several of the staff who are here now I haven't actually uh, met. And to, and, and to actually just give you a little window into Churchill and what we do. So um, I'm the science coordinator at the Churchill Mormon Study Center, and I have a few slides in the middle of the presentation to show you a bit about the facility where the volunteers actually stay. Um, but it's my job there to work with all the scientists and researchers who are coming to the field station, which is essentially what it is to work. So this, the study center itself supports a wide range of research predominantly in the physical sciences and natural sciences, but also uh, in social science and health research as, as well. So I'll, I'll give you a little window into that, but uh, my other role is as an Earthwatch PI, and I work with Dr. Peter Kershaw, who's from the University of Alberta, on the Climate Change at Arctic's Edge uh, project. So uh, this is me in my natural habitat. <laughs> uh, I don't normally look quite like this. Uh, in Churchill, Manitoba. Uh, Churchill is located in a really interesting uh, zone, as Mark mentioned. It's right at the edge of the Arctic. So just to give you an idea, uh, this is a circumpolar uh, projection. So North Pole is right in the center of the map here. Uh, Churchill is located in this giant pink area. I really love this map because it cuts off everything else. <laughs> <laughs> so important, including some of Canada that we don't like to think about so much. Uh, but uh, just to give you some pers perspective, Churchill is located right at the tip of this arrow. And uh, when we talk about it being at the Arctic's edge, it's the transition zone where the boreal forest changes into the Arctic tundra. And I'll show you some pictures to give you a, a bit more of a mental picture of what that actually means. But also, it's located right on the west coast of Hudson Bay. And Hudson Bay is, is an extension of the Arctic Ocean that penetrates into the middle of North America. So this is all Arctic Ocean water in here. So you also have a transition or a, a zone of change between freshwater environments and the marine environment right next to it. So if we, we zoom in particularly on this area right here on the west coast of, of uh, Hudson Bay where Churchill is located, and if you're ever trying to look for it, just look for this little peninsula that sticks out into Hudson Bay about halfway up the coast. That's right where Churchill is if you need to point it out on a map. There's a great map in behind the screen here that you guys look at every day that has Churchill marked on it. So if we zoom in on that area, the other really interesting thing is it's not just a zone of change between boreal forest and open tundra, a vegetation change. It's also an area of change of permafrost conditions. So permafrost is permanently frozen ground. And this blue line here sort of indicates where that line changes. Now it's, it's a hazy line, just like tree line is. It isn't like, oh, I'm on permafrost. <laughs> oh, I'm not. <laughs> okay. So the below this is what we call discontinuous uh, permafrost. And the large area in green here is the Hudson Bay lowlands, which is the, the second largest contiguous wetland on the face of the planet, second to only another subarctic wetland uh, in Siberia. So a very extensive zone that spans permafrost as well. And this is where our project sort of ties two things together, looking at wetlands, as well as looking at the terrestrial environment and the tree line change and permafrost uh, change. So all of these things are changing right around Churchill, uh, where we're trying to capture what some of those environmental changes are. And if we take one more step in, in a mapping sense, and look right at that little bit of coast that sticks out of, out into Hudson Bay. So here's uh, Wapusk National Park, which is a national federal land, uh, and then a provincially governed management area around that, and that's where most of our research project is situated. And then the town of Churchill here, right at the mouth of the Churchill River. So the, uh, the station itself is located out in a remote environment, about 25 kilometers from the actual town of Churchill. So 
most times when you say climate change in Arctic, you think about these guys, right? <laughs> and most times when you say Churchill, you also talk about polar bears. And so I thought it would be romantic, although we don't study polar bears as part of our research project, to maybe make that connection to something that you do know or that you have heard in the, in the media about polar bears. And the story there really has to do with changing Arctic sea ice concentrations. And this is the recent um, map that, or graph that's been put out by the National Snow and Ice Data Center showing that rapid decline in sea ice. And this is the sea ice extent in September. And Mark and I were talking about this this morning, you know, the idea that some of the projections, uh, last year's low of sea ice was worse than the worst case scenario that had been predicted in terms of sea ice. So what does that impact does that have on things like polar bears? Well, when sea ice disappears, the polar bears end up on land. And that's one thing that Churchill really capitalizes on is that opportunity for people to come and see polar bears. Now, there are times of the year that are better to see them, and we hope that our Earthwatch volunteers are able to see a polar bear. But if they come in February, the bears are out on the ice. It's not a great time. Nicole came in September, and I wasn't able to show her uh, a polar bear, but uh, a lot of our Earthwatch volunteers do. So what is that impact on bears? And this, this connection is well known because of long-term monitoring, like some of the work that we're doing. So across the bottom here, you have the date of sea ice breakup. So in spring conditions, when was there less than 50% of ice cover on Hudson Bay? That's what this shows across the bottom. Up here we have the body condition of the bears, and this is an index number, so it takes integrates several measurements together, and we separate them into females uh, and males, body condition. So one thing you can see is as the breakup date is later into the summertime, the body condition index value is higher. And this is where a lot of the work uh, has focused and that sort of media presentation about impacts of polar bears uh, because of changing sea ice conditions because of climate change. So I thought it would be remiss not to show you this really great Churchill data set and this is where that information came from. If you count up all these dots you get somewhere around 35 which is 35 years of record. Uh, and those are the kinds of information that or data that we need to be able to say something about how a species is changing. But what about other aspects of the Arctic or things that are happening at the Arctic's edge? And that's where our Earthwatch program uh, and the research we're conducting comes in. So to show you a little bit about those environments, so this is what open tundra looks like in the winter. I'll show you a graph that actually indicates like snowpack depth. Our next upcoming team in February will be looking at snowpack depth and adding to our long-term data set there. But here's what it looks like in the summer with some of our summer visitors. These aren't Earthwatch volunteers, but uh, <laughs> a few other things. Uh, the, the local caribou that come in, you can see Hudson Bay in the background with the, the ice on it, so just right along the coast there. Uh, moving into the tree islands, so into that forest tundra transition where you get groups of trees uh, out on the tundra. Here's what they look like in the, the summertime, those tree islands uh, where we spend quite a bit of time. And then into the forest, which still doesn't look exactly like a forest that you would expect, uh, but you can see the, the fluffy snow uh, in the bottom and the spruce trees here laden, snow branches, the, the branches are laden with snowpack. And here's what it looks like in the summertime. And just peeking out here, you can see one of our weather stations uh, that are located in various micro uh, habitats here. So just to give you an idea of some of the range of terrestrial conditions that the volunteers would be working in. And then of course, I mentioned the Hudson Bay lowlands. So this is all in a bigger context of these <coughs> shallow tundra ponds. About 25 to 40% of the landscape around the Churchill area is covered by these shallow water bodies. And you can see in here some of the tree stands and the open peatlands and tundra areas mixed in as well. <coughs> uh, and what I'm really interested in are these shallow tundra ponds. Pete Kershaw focuses mostly on the more terrestrial environments. And just to give you another shot as you look out from the plane window, it's, it's really obvious how uh, key these open water bodies are and wetlands are on the landscape. 
So uh, just to give you a few photos, this is uh, last winter was our team. So there's uh, Pete, Pete and I in the background. Uh, here, uh, one of my long-term technicians, Kat Jansen, and a couple of the PhD students who are working on the project, uh, Amanda and Krista as well. Uh, um, our teams uh, do change quite a bit. Obviously in March, we look like this in our winter gear, uh, going out and measuring snowpack, contrasted with you know, one of our teams in September. This is uh, last September, uh, working, working in the wetlands where we're all dressed in hip waders. So I'm not sure if some of you have seen some of the different pictures from our teams, but it's quite a wide diversity, as I'm sure it is with many of the other uh, PIs that you, you work with. The conditions change significantly. It can be minus 40, degrees Celsius with the winter team, and it can be plus 20 uh, in the summertime with a team and lots of buds and other, other things to contend with. We also work with team, team teams during the summertime, so one of our uh, tundra uh, wetland teams uh, is predominantly uh, teenage teenagers who come uh, to work with us. So just a little bit about the study center to help set the stage before I talk about a few research results that you can maybe take home with you is uh, the study center is Northern Canada's only independent nonprofit uh, field station. Uh, we operate on a, uh, not with a government agency or a university. We do operate as an independent operation. Uh, it is a com community driven initiative. So the local community of Churchill is directly involved in uh, the strategic <coughs> vision for the center. There are five full time employees uh, that and we all live in Churchill and uh, several of us have been living there for 10, 10 or more years. And we also have up to 10 part-time seasonal staff, summer students who work with us, as well as uh, folks from the local community who provide housekeeping and maintenance services as well. Uh, our main goal is to provide research and education opportunities and uh, logistic services. So this is an example of one of our learning programs, uh, education program. Uh, they come, uh, in this particular case, they were there to see polar bears, uh, so they would work with the scientists uh, in an educational framework. Uh, there would be lectures in the evening and they would go out on the, on the tundra buddies during the daytime to watch bears and uh, to work with them. Um, we've been in operation since 1976. It's our 36th year of working. And uh, the really great thing we've been able to do is work with some fun, fantastic folks. So some of you, I had to put this picture in, some of you may know Carly Basler. She was our long-term Earthwatch coordinator at the center who left uh, last year. She's now in power electrician in training. And uh, Katrina Jansen uh, was also a long-term technician. And they would pull stunts like this on me on a regular, regular basis. So fantastic people to work with. And now we have a fantastic facility. Last year, uh, 18 months ago, we, we grabbed open a brand new purpose-built building uh, to be able to continue our operations. And uh, again, just to give you a window into the summertime versus the, uh, the, winter, the winter time. Um, this building is, uh, has dormitory facilities, so this would be where the volunteers would be staying. Uh, we also have various uh, lounges and uh, classrooms uh, that they can work in. So they, we have a classroom that's dedicated for the Earthwash uh, program to, to use. We also serve all of our meals on site. It's uh, kind of a one-stop shopping facility. We have a cook, so uh, as PIs, we have it quite nice. We don't have to worry about making sure all the logistic activities get done, as well as laboratory facilities. And uh, we also have a viewing dome, which is called the Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> you, know, the top, you can actually look out around on the landscape around. It's great for watching Northern Lights. So uh, a great facility uh, to work out of. It's also a, what we'd like to think is a, the most uh, sustainable building that we could produce in this particular environment. Uh, so it's uh, well insulated. Uh, it also has a, a, um, a, we, we can recover out of the ventilation air about 80% of the heat before we exhaust it. And this really makes a difference in the winter time when it's minus 40 outside. So we have uh, fairly efficient heat recovery uh, units in the building. We also have some very simple technologies, uh, passively heating uh, water that's coming into the building with uh, shower drain water, for example, trying to recover heat out of that, as well as some innovative uh, waste processing sites. We have composting toilets on, on site for some of our bathrooms, and we also have uh, biofilters so we can treat our sewage right on site. Because we are a remote facility, we don't have access to the normal 
utilities, uh, utility system and utility grid, other than power, we do have power uh, at, on site. So let's talk a little bit about the research and some of the results or take home messages maybe from our project. This is Pete uh, Kershaw, he couldn't be here today of course, sent me along as the much cuter emissary. <laughs> <laughs> But I did notice that you featured him prominently in the 2013 expedition briefing, or, or expedition guide in the middle. I think there's a fantastic picture of him also in a snow pit, which is his natural habitat uh, as well. He also loves confusing graphs, but just to try to give you a flavor of what, uh, what uh, he's doing with the project, I mentioned those different microsites. So at each of those, we have weather stations that are collecting really key information one of the things that I'll show you in the next slide, which is a little bit more confusing, is all of those sites <coughs> together. But this is what we would look at for one particular site. Across the bottom is months of the year, so it's much easier to look at the top and see the years there. So uh, really just a time series. On the side, we have temperature in degrees Celsius. The first line to look at is the blue line, which is air temperature. Um, no big surprise, in the winter time, it's cold. In the summertime, it's not so cold. It's really not so bad, but a big range of temperature. And these are average daily temperatures. So they're not really showing the, the true minimum cold temperature or maximum warm. If you look at the zero centimeters, this is right at the ground surface. So the temperature right at the vegetation air interface. One of the things that you quickly <coughs> can notice at a site like this is in the summertime, they're very similar to each other. But in the wintertime, they're very different almost 30 degrees in some cases and that's because of the snow on the ground and that's one of the reasons that we're really interested in snowpack depth and how it varies between sites for example if you're a little shrew so we have these little sharp-nosed shrews we call them they're about this big around they weigh about the same as a nickel so they're very little they can't hibernate because there's just no way they can eat enough to hibernate they have to stay active during winter time so if you're a little shrew and you weigh, you know, between five and ten grams, would you rather, you know, sort of like the would you, you know, would you rather minus forty or would you rather minus eight or ten? I think it's pretty obvious you would prefer to have a nice insulating blanket of snow cover on top of you. So the other thing that this graph illustrates, and maybe sh a bit in the next one as well, is is the difference between years. Some years it's that ground temperature can be quite cold, or quite a bit cooler than, uh, for example, here where the, the, the fall, it took a long time for ground temperatures to, to cool down. And one of the stories with climate change is that incredible variation that's occurring. And one of the things that Sarah and I were just talking about, you know, those extremes, they're, they're, they're becoming more extreme and more often. Uh, we were discussing the hurricane uh, event, you know, and how those are extreme events are occurring more and more often. So this is one of the other uh, key graphs that's again got years on the bottom here. So now we have uh, 10 years of, of really great data and you can see as, as time goes by we've added more sites to our network. Uh, and then this is mean annual air temperature. So each of these dots is one of the sites where we work at and I wouldn't worry too too much about which site is which. The, the thing to look at is the overall trend in air temperature in 10 years. So you're just looking at a short window of time here, but this trajectory is pretty clear. Uh, it doesn't have a great R squared value because of the, those extreme variations. What happens in Churchill is we tend to get years where we have what we call Arctic summers, which push the temperatures way down, or we have boreal forest summers, which are nice and warm and dry and sunny and push the temperatures way up. So you can see the spread in temperatures from somewhere, you know, a mean annual air temperature of minus 8.5 all the way up to minus two. So large differences, but overall about one and a half degrees Celsius of warming over the last 10 years in air temperature. Now, if we look just briefly at permafrost temperatures, so very <coughs> similar graph, the years across the bottom, mean annual air, uh, uh, sorry, mean annual temperatures at 80 centimeters, which we would call near surface permafrost temperatures. So these blue dots at the bottom here are sites that have uh, permafrost close to the center or close to the surface. 
but you can see here zero versus here we're down at minus four. There's about, in Churchill, about 0.8 degrees Celsius, 0.5 to 0.8 degrees Celsius of warming. This permafrost, near surface permafrost, is very close <coughs> to zero degrees Celsius. So uh, another few decades, possibly, it depends, like we're looking at rates that are starting to increase more rapidly. Uh, we could be losing permafrost at these particular sites. And at the Mackenzie Mountain site, where uh, Pete also works, the, the range is even more extreme there. In the last two decades, this is also uh, half a degree over 10 years, is 1.25 degrees Celsius of warming. And Pete's been working at that site uh, since he did his PhD. So he has a long record and has extended it with climate, uh, sorry, with tree rings and also with air photos. Um, so if we look at the snow cover record, and this is what we do with our winter teams, and I think it's really one of the strengths of the EarthWatch program is contributing to long-term monitoring of these environments. And it's really difficult sometimes as researchers for us to be able to secure funding for long-term monitoring, but you can start to see patterns emerging as you look at things over time. And just looking strictly at depth here, uh, on the tundra, snow covers tend to be fairly shallow. The wind picks up the snow, <coughs> tends to blow it into the trees or these tree islands. Uh, here you can see an example of the snowpack in one of those tree islands, looking at you know somewhere around one and a half or 1.8 meters of snow. And you can see the variability on these. Sometimes we're digging snow pits that are three and four meters in depth, and that's that picture I showed you of Pete in one of those uh, deep snow pits. Forest, it doesn't seem to matter what kind of forest it is, the snowpack is all relatively similar. This fen here is a wetland environment, so it's not treed, very much like a tundra environment, but it will have uh, sedge vegetation that's typical of wetlands, so you get a little bit more snowpack, those taller sedges will trap, um, trap a bit more snow. One of the things that really concerns us is that if you look at the last few years of the record, particularly the last four or five, there's definitely a downward trend in most of the environments of snow cover. So a thinning of snowpack. Right now, it's still within the average value. So we can't say, yes, there's a thinning of snowpack that's gone beyond you know, our 10-year our <coughs> average. But it definitely looks like this, this downward declining uh, trend in thinning snowpack. And snowpack is such an important feature. You know, it, it's gonna have to thin quite a bit in a forested environment. You know, 20 to 30 centimeters is a good insulating blanket of snow. But in a fed environment, we're losing snowpack. And what impact does that have yeah. on my example of a small mammal? You know, when is it too cold? for you to be able to make it through the winter time or to find adequate habitat where you could indeed make it through the winter. And, and this is just talking about depth. It doesn't talk about water equivalents and uh, all of those other things. The other piece that's really important to that uh, I couldn't really find a good graph to kind of capture the idea is uh, we talked about trees at the beginning. And this is a hemispherical photo looking up into the canopy of trees. So this was kind of my best effort. Uh, one of the things that Pete's been working on and his most recent PhD student is, is the tree line expanding farther north? So are trees establishing themselves out in the tundra zone? Or is tree line staying the same? Or is it actually receding? So what they found is that in the future, this, this canopy cover will be more dense. So we don't get trees really establishing themselves much in the tundra zone. So the conditions aren't right, not enough resources, maybe it's still too cold, but what is happening is more trees are establishing where there already are trees. We would call that infilling of, of the canopy. And uh, this one has a great mosquito in it as well. Um, <laughs> giant mosquitoes in there. Yeah, we still have giant mosquitoes. <laughs> just, uh, just a reminder. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not really gonna talk a lot more about the trees because I couldn't kind of fit everything in, but I did want to talk a little bit because it is fairly prominent in the recent research that, uh, that we've been doing with Earthwatch teams. And I mentioned this to Mark this morning. You know, there's nothing 
more, I don't know if exciting is the right word, but as a, as a scientist, you go out there with a team of 10 really excited folks, and you'd be like, right, in this, you know, five meter by five meter plot, we're gonna count every seedling that's in there. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and off you go, you know, hands and knees crawling through counting seedlings, and just how valuable that is to our research findings, and being able to do it in different environments, and how that feeds into some of our <coughs> graduate students' research and their ability, you know, to pr produce world-class research uh, at resulting from, you know, that level of excitement and those people who want to experience, you know, a place like Churchill. So just to talk a little bit, I'll try to keep this brief. It's my research, so I tend to wander off. Uh, I work with Dr. Ben Cash here from the University of Central Arkansas, and we are interested in tundra wetlands and their uh, um, ability to, su to support species diversity. And we do, we've been doing this uh, for about eight years now with uh, teen teams, and it's really neat to watch those kids get really fired up about being in the Arctic and you know, to see northern lights and polar bears and all, ask all those really important and great science questions. But what we're really interested in are these guys. Uh, this is a wood frog. Uh, they have a really wide distribution, so you've probably seen one uh, around. But uh, we're working right at the very edge of their distribution. Um, one of the important things that we've found or worked with in, in, the, in the past is looking at genetic diversity. And one of the things we know is as you approach the edge of a range of a species, genetic diversity usually drops off significantly. And with, with wood frogs, the genetic diversity essentially goes to nothing. Uh, they're really quite similar genetically. And, and that was what we were able to do with uh, some of our first team teams to look at genetic diversity. The other species is a boreal chorus frog. And they really are this green. This is about the right, uh, right color for them. And uh, between the two species, uh, the work that we've done in the recent past is, is looking at what kind of habitat do you like. If you're a wood frog, you would think based on the, the chorus of wood frogs in June that you could find them anywhere on the landscape. But they're actually relatively picky about where they like to hang out. Um, and I'll, I'll just use these photos as an example. This is sort of the habitat that wood frogs really like. It's kind of like Goldilocks and the three bears. So if you get into the bigger ones, they're, they're, they're a bit too big, and there's not really <coughs> enough vegetation uh, for the tadpoles to be able to hide. You know, so it's, it's sort of like, ah, oh, that one's too big. And then you've got you know, a smaller wetland, which doesn't have a lot of open water, too much vegetation. It's kind of the, ah, oh, that one's too small, and it's got too much crap in it. And then there's like, you know, the just right condition where it's, you know, kind of a medium sized wetland, it's got, you know, a bit of sedge on the edge for the tadpoles to hang in, but it's nice and sat uh, super saturated with oxygen. That's the just right conditions where wood frogs like to breathe. So if you go to one like this, probably one out of every two wetlands, you'll find a wood frog like this. If you're a boreal for chorus frog though, what we think with them is, is they're, they're right at the edge of their range. Literally, you can go maybe another 10 kilometers north and find, not find a boreal course frog. And trust me, we've taken the teams and tried to find them. <laughs> and you know, that's a result too, that they're just not there. They're just trying to make a go of it. So if you find a boreal course frog, they could be anywhere. Uh, but maybe only one out of every 10 wetlands might be find uh, a boreal course frog. So really looking at those species and, and how they're how they're choosing their habitat and what that means for them. Now this is another uh, project that a PhD student of mine is working on. Um, this is a, what we call a tundra pond case study. So in this one you can see there's a few more trees in the transition zone. This one's actually more in open tundra. And if we look at water levels, this is the other important story with climate change and wetlands. These are very shallow tundra ponds. So I'm going to have you look at this one at the top that's called left pond. I know, great name. And this one at the bottom that's called Strange Pond. And these are relative water levels. Um, so this is basically dry <coughs> on both of these cases. And one of the things that we're finding is with warmer air temperatures, because these water bodies are so shallow, this is the case of 2011 where they dried somewhere towards the end of September uh, in here, is that this dry period 
is potentially occurring earlier and earlier, which means if you're an amphibian, for example, and you have a tadpole cage that relies on being in water for its reproductive cycle, if the water, if the wetland dries, you have an issue, <laughs> okay? If you rely on having open water or water to swim in, you know, tadpoles to some extent can live in the mud, but they do need to be able to swim around and eat and then uh, metamorph in. So if, if the hydro period, the period that the wetland is wet, is getting shorter, you're compromising the reproductive cycle of some of those uh, species. So this is one of the things that uh, when um, Nicole visited us with the uh, September teams, we're really interested in what happens down here. And you can see uh, the fall rains play a really important role in these tundra wetlands and when they happen. Okay, so if they happen in late August, you know, back here, the wetlands, some of these may not dry as much as in other years where 2011 that happened very close to the end of the, end of the season. Okay, so just a little window into that. And I'm going to skip the next one because I think it will be slightly confusing. Hmm. Maybe I'll try it. So if we take those two ponds and compare them, this is a dissimilarity analysis. Um, early on in the season, most of the tundra wetlands are very similar to each other. Okay, as you as the season progresses, they get more dissimilar from each other, and this is one of the reasons why we focus several of our tundra wetland teams later on in the season because that's the point in time where they diverge the farthest apart from each other. So our wetland teams tend to be in September or towards uh, the middle of September, I think is when you were up there, uh, because that's when we'll have the most diversity or most differences between uh, wetlands. So we put the <coughs> earthwash teams into the context of our time sampling that goes on throughout the summer. <laughs> Uh, so this is what September looks like in Churchill. It's a beautiful time of year. There are definitely less bugs. Uh, did you even wear a bug net? No. Yeah, uh, typically it's quite breezy, uh, quite nice conditions. Um, usually there's a polar bear or two hanging out around as well. Okay, uh, the other thing i just like to hint or uh, just discuss a little bit is the, the opportunity that Earthwatch gives uh, us as researchers, opportunities to do pilot projects. So one of the things that we're interested in the Hudson Bay Lowlands is, is uh, the idea of permafrost being a carbon sink. And Pete has done extensive work on looking at carbon storage in the soils and how it varies. But one of the things that we don't know a lot about are how much carbon is stored in wetlands, in sediments in the bottom of wetlands, and how that gets released. So one of the really, really cool things that we did this year that was really exciting was to take a volunteer team our red and black team <laughs> in our tundra gear out and actually shovel and sweep snow off ponds to look at the bubbles that are actually in the ice. So these shallow tundra <coughs> ponds freeze entirely to the bottom each year, but in that ice is captured bubbles from the decomposition of the sediments that's occurred during freezing. And these bubbles are really cool. I know. Really? <laughs> yeah, they are. And it was really neat to fire up a team about shoveling snow and sweeping <laughs> snow uh, and what we were able to find. So this was our prize uh, find on this particular uh, wetland. This is the PhD student, Krista, who's working uh, on the project with me. And it's hard to see, but there are all bubbles. All these light-colored areas are actually all methane. Uh, bubbles. So we were able to develop a protocol uh, that we could use with a team of citizen scientists to look at methane bubbles and they got right into it uh, in terms of the information that we were able to collect. And just as a little window into what we're trying to do here, in Siberia, uh, it's almost like, okay, I travel a lot, so I have great science experiments in my fridge, and they're usually in an old yogurt container. And when I come back and take the lid off, <laughs> yikes. That's kind of a little bit what these tundra ponds are like. Okay, so they're open water, you've got the lid off during the summertime, the ice comes along and you throw the lid on. Okay, and then they become a closed system. And boy, do they do some fantastic stuff when they're a closed system. Spring comes along, what happens? 
ice melts, you take the lid off. <laughs> In Siberia, when you take the lid off, you know it. There's so much methane and carbon dioxide that are released in the springtime. Also, in Alaska wetlands, they found kind of a similar type of scenario, maybe not as great of a blast of methane and CO2 as the Siberian wetlands, but still a decent amount, you can detect it. Um, of course, methane and CO2 are great greenhouse gases, so we were trying, we've been trying to kind of get at this in Churchill wetlands, but what we find here is it's almost like our yogurt container has got a few holes in it, or a cracker too. So when you take it off in the springtime, you don't get that same blast of methane. So we were kind of backing up questions from there. So where is it going or where did it come? Maybe it's not producing as much. But by doing this bubble mapping, we were able to determine that indeed the bubbles are very similar to what we see in other tundra wetland systems. It's just we have a more leaky mechanism that methane finds its way out over the course of the winter time. So this is a, a developing research question in Churchill and it's sort of, we use the Earthwatch team to help us kind of flesh things out uh, and then hand it off to a PhD student for more work. So I, I just like to recognize the contribution of Earthwatch and some of these really key piloting things and getting people interested or fired up about things that sometimes maybe aren't as exciting, like mm -hmm. sweeping snow <laughs> off of tundra ponds, but boy did we have great fun. So just to try to put some of these into a summary slide and a few take home messages, the thinner midwinter snowpack cover that we discussed, you know, we're not really willing to say we're outside of the average yet, but they are in the last four years. Uh, strong seedling recruitment within the tree line, so where we already have trees, we're infilling things. About half a degree <coughs> Celsius of near surface uh, permafrost warming in the last decade. Shorter summer hydro periods, so the time the wetlands are wet is getting shorter. Uh, a pilot methane study, and then I didn't really talk too much, but uh, we also sampled pond sediments uh, for some of the work that uh, M Amanda, another PhD student of mine, and that's what we used the Alcoa, the corporate team, to do. And it, it was a fantastic opportunity for us to try uh, something different in a shorter team and also with a, a corporate organi organization as well. Uh, just uh, after I talked with Mark, I went and grabbed a screenshot. Um, this is one of the ways we outreach from the study center. So Mark, I had mentioned the podcast, this one, on wetlands. Uh, I had a student who put together a 20-minute uh, podcast. If you listen to All in the Mind, uh, Science Friday on NPR, they're kind of that sort of style. Uh, ways to outreach with science to the general public. There are five episodes that are 20 minutes long. You just click on one of these and you can listen to it right online. You don't actually have to download it. And the last one is about, I'm a wetland, is about the Earthwatch uh, Tundra Wetland Ecology Project. So if you're interested, avioyak.ca is the website. Avioyak is an Inuit word, which is how they describe when mosquitoes are buzzing around your head. So uh, we, we decided to call it avioyak.ca, the buzzing in your ear is about science from Churchill, Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kaylee is the, is the name of the student, and she's, uh, we're hoping to develop another series of these uh, this summer as well uh, on different science projects that are going on. So just one of the outreach tools uh, that we use to feature a project like our Earthwatch project and other science projects going on uh, in Churchill. So thanks very much for your time at lunchtime. I appreciate being able to come down here and talk a little bit about the, bring a little bit of Churchill to you and uh, to make, meet some of the people that we work with on a day-to-day on -day basis. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them now. I realize some people probably have to run off and do other things, but uh, yeah, we'll take a few open questions. Can I just leave?